Well, we are here today with Mr. Tom Schumacher. He's the uh, division dean of the Verde campus, right? Campus dean. Campus dean. Campus. And you have worked here since when? Since 1977. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. What was your position when you first started here? I was hired here originally to be a an art instructor to teach ceramics and jewelry classes. Hmm. And d so your background is as a potter, yes, or I'm fine art. And so you studied that, and yes. you were an instructor, and you taught for how long before moving on to? Well, I taught um, the better part of 26 years. Wow. Um, and then some opportunities came up in administration that, that seemed seemed to be kind of the next logical step in my career at Yavapai yeah, College, so mm -hmm. went on to that. Did you like working with students? Oh, yeah. That's one of the things I missed the most about mm -hmm. doing that, the That's what, one of the things I was going to ask you, how it is to change from, from being an instructor for so many years to changing to what you do now. Um, th there's a big difference. There's definitely a big difference. The student interaction is, is as I said, is, is a part that uh, I really do miss. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's um, in, in doing the administrative part, I've, I've always done the administrative part as an instructor because I was the only full-time instructor in, in the whole department. Now, did you start? Did you found that department? Or was it here? Were you hired? There were, there were a few classes here, but I was basically hired to, to build the program, mm -hmm. which wow. was, was what I was doing when I was in school. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, my first job out of school was in, uh, in Rhode Island, and it was a job to, to build a studio, build a school. And back then, how big was this campus here? In, in this campus consisted of the four original buildings, uh, buildings A, B, C, and D. Not F yet, because F, no, 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 F, F, F didn't the come until, building. Uh, F came in 1987. Hmm. So where was your, your studio, your ceramic studio, all those years? The ceramic studio was down in building B. And that's down where down those, in the little, lower, uh, those little what, what, buildings What are. people around here call the lower quad. Wow. So this, those four original buildings were here mm -hmm. way back then. And they were supposed to be temporary buildings <laughs> that are now 30 plus years old. <laughs> wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, what's, c c is there one particular experience here at the college that has given you the most satisfaction or that has made you feel the you know like you accomplished a lot by it well a lot of times people ask me when they they realize how long I've actually worked here uh, a lot of times people say how, how could you work there that long mm -hmm. but that's actually been one of the very interesting things about working here mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. because it's been a constant change mm -hmm. so I mentioned being down there in B building which is now um, which is now storage for facilities. Facilities <laughs> is going to be moving in there, but it, it was a lot of things. Uh, for years, that building housed our nursing program. Mm -hmm. um, but every few years, there were changes that came about. Mm -hmm. So we were down there in that building and um, started the ceramics program, so we built kilns and equipment down there. Hmm. Uh, within a few years of that, yeah, those are all gone, um, we moved the whole art department down to Clarkdale. Oh. And the Clark, we had what we called the Clarkdale Art Center, which was a building down there that I was in charge of. So as far as uh, that, again, kind of the administration part was, was always part of my teaching. Mm -hmm. um, we had the old building down there right on Main Street, the big two-story building. And over in the town of Clarkdale, the town outside of, Clarkdale. of the campus. Right. Huh. Um, that was the Clarkdale Art Center. We had business classes upstairs, but we had art classes all throughout the building. Um, we had a computer lab there. We had theater. We had a stage. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty amazing place. And we were there until, um, well, it's the late, uh, late to mid 1980s. Like I said, when they uh, they built F Building, oh. which is currently the art building, mm -hmm. um, we moved into that in about 1987. Mm. And what was the purpose of 
going off campus to Clarkdale, it wasn't because they couldn't yet build a new building here on right. campus. There wasn't anything else here. Mm -hmm. um, the library back then was also that. in A building. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that's Matter of fact, the library was in a room about the size of this room here. Uh, we hmm. used to call it the library closet. So there was the administration was in A building and then a part of it was the library. That's pretty amazing to imagine that compared to this. Yes. And was it gradual? How gradual was it? Because I think that, well, since I've been here, which has been only three or four years, all this building was built and then the new science yeah. building over there. So I think, isn't, hasn't there been more growth in the last five or ten years yes. than there was back in the 70s oh, and the way, 80s? Way, way, way more growth. Uh, things kind of crawled along. Um, we went to that building in Clarkdale because we, we you know, it was a leased building, mm -hmm. but we had a huge amount of space there that we didn't have here and we knew we wouldn't have the buildings here for a while. Yeah. So that, um, that actually was a very nice space for us. But what the Verde campus has here is, and they still do, we have a lot of land. So there's a lot of potential to grow. And as the college grows, we'll be certainly building more building and doing more fascinating things here. Mm -hmm. And the campus, to start with, it had the amount of land that it has now yes. to build on. So there was, the idea was there from the beginning yeah. to enlarge. The campus, that this, the Yavapai College, the Verde campus sits on about 120 acres here. And a lot of people don't realize how much Wow, so it could potentially have. become a huge university. Yeah, huh? yeah. <laughs> we'll it see. could, it could definitely do that. And do you know why it was that it grew so much over the last few years and not before? Did the government in, uh, give more funding to the college lately? Or? Well, we got more funding through, through bonding. We uh, passed a couple of bonds. When I say we, the, the citizens passed some bonds, uh, which actually helped to make the place grow. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's, we need to have bond money to build buildings. Mm -hmm. So with the bonds came... Uh, the first buildings that came were uh, actually Building H, um, Building I, which which used to be the library, mm -hmm. which is now Student Affairs. Mm -hmm. um, those were two major buildings, and then there was another bond issue. Excuse me, and, and F building came in that that first bond issue, and then the latest one we actually built this building here, mm -hmm. um, this, which is now the library and and also. We have classrooms upstairs in this building. Right, that's a very nice building. So you were involved in administration even when you were teaching. Uh, I was involved, but I was um, I was still actively teaching, teaching full time. Mm -hmm. But I was. Uh, we we don't have on this campus what we call department chairs. But uh, if we did, I would have been the chairman of the art department. Mm -hmm. um, as it was, I was. Uh, I think at one point I was called the director of the art department or the coordinator or something, mm. something along those lines. But you went beyond that, obviously, yes. too. Then how how did that happen, though? Moving, shifting from the art department to the a whole series of events. There were um, the the campus was was small. Um, years ago, we got our our first. Um, assistant dean on campus uh, who was Betty Claus and Betty um, worked here for a number of years and and was a full-time teacher and when we got that administrative position still there's still faculty positions but they have a lot of administrative responsibility mm -hmm. um, as we continue to grow we we split into two divisions and when Betty left uh, we had two divisions um, Actually, Jenny Chanda was one of our first division chairs. Oh, interesting. She was just interviewed here earlier. Yeah. So she has, <laughs> has some, some great history, too. Yeah. Um, so she was one of our first division chairs. Um, and then and, and we, we called them, at that point, Divisions 1 and Division 2. Um, Carol German was the division chair for Division 2. And as... Um, as things change, as people have left the positions, Jenny left the position. I um, uh, can't recall who came in immediately following Jenny, uh, but then Terrence Pratt mm -hmm. came in as division dean, 
and when Carol German left, um, I stepped in as division dean, division assistant dean is what we called him at the time, for division two. And when was this? This was about um, 19, late 1990, mid 1990s. Oh. So, and as the division dean, which is what we call him now, so th at the time they were the division assistant dean. What, what a division assistant dean does is they are still full-time faculty, but they teach at least one class. So most of their time goes towards the administrative stuff. Administration. Okay. Um, and that's kind of where I got involved. So mm -hmm. I'm still teaching a class, but a division assistant dean. Mm, so you're still teaching pottery yes. and then being the assistant dean yeah. too. Oh. And then from there, um, then we had, uh, we had, as far as the campus went, we had a campus assistant dean. And at the time there was a gentleman, um, his name was uh, John Plett. And when John left, um, well, there were several people in front of him, but when John left, um, they wanted someone to fill that as an interim. Mm -hmm. So I, I took on the responsibilities of, of the division, or excuse me, <laughs> gotta get my title straight here, <laughs> the Assistant Dean of Instruction mm -hmm. for the Verde Valley Campus. But at the same time, I had my responsibilities as the Assistant Dean for the division. So I had actually a dual role. A dual deanship. Dual dean, yeah. <laughs> dual, dual assistant deanships. Um, and I did that for about uh, a year and a half. And in that time, I was still trying, still teaching, but I, I realized that I couldn't really teach and give it the full, you know, really give it my heart that I had to. Um, to be an instructor. So you had to make a choice. I had to make you a choice. either go back to teaching or take full time and administrative position. The opportunity came up. They made they changed the position from an assistant dean, campus assistant dean, to a dean's position. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually did that for an interim position for a while, um, and it was the title was the division. It wasn't the division, it was um, Dean of Instruction for the Verde Valley Campus. Dean of Instruction. Right. Mm. So I took that job, and when I took that job, I decided to, you know, I couldn't do that and teach at the same time. Mm -hmm. So from there, uh, there were some changes in administration, um, major changes. Um, we had a campus executive dean. Uh, here, who, her name was Eula Dean, Dean Dean. <laughs> so you see where I get a little confused with the, <laughs> some of the titles sometimes. Um, so when Eula Dean left the campus, it left an opening here. So I took over. Um, oh, excuse me, I continued my role as, as Dean of Instruction, mm -hmm. and we got a new dean here and, and vice president uh, in Paul Kessel. And Paul Kessel was. The Verde Campus Executive Dean slash Vice President of Instruction um, slash she was <laughs> something else too, um, because there was a change in we had a, a shakeup in our presidency. Dorian Daly left. When Dorian Daly left, uh, several other administrators left. Um, so for a while, Paul Kessel basically ran the Abbott High College from the Verde Campus mm -hmm. here as as the Vice President. Mm -hmm. We were in between presidents. Mm -hmm. Um, we went to, they did an, um, an interim placement of a president um, that was um, about three years ago now. And with that interim president, um, Paul Kessel's duty became more and more involved with just the overall um, district-wide responsibilities. And um, with Paul taking on those other responsibilities, he was spending more and more time in Prescott. Um, we were also at that time going through a search for a permanent president. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't think of the name of that interim president right now. I'll think of it in a minute here. Um, but the search finally was completed, and that's when we hired Dr. Horton, who was Dr. James President Horton. for the whole college, not right. just this campus. Yes, who is, who is currently our president. Mm -hmm. So we have James Horton now as our president. 
And at that time, uh, Paul Kessel decided to retire. He had, he had actually came to Yavapai College in retirement. Uh, he was at uh, uh, one of the one of the community colleges uh, up north, and he went back to retirement. The position was open here on campus. The new president, James Horton, asked me if I was interested in the position, which I said I was. So I then became the campus dean for the Verde Valley campus of Yavapai College. Which you are now. Which I am still. now. Yeah. Wow. And as I'm sitting here thinking about it, it's, my head's kind of swimming with the whole thing as well. <laughs> a lot of things went on. A lot of, that's, yeah, that's a lot, a lot of different, different transitions yeah. from being hired as a potter. As a potter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then and I would never would have believed it if you said that to me, you know, that many years ago. But uh, it just, things kind of, you know, fell into place. Mm -hmm. It was the next you, logical step. You never had the the plan to eventually no. become the dean of That was the, not my, I didn't <laughs> sit out with a plan and write it, write it all down like that. It's yeah. just, uh, as the opportunities came up, um, you know, sometimes you just say to yourself, might as well try this. Mm -hmm. And what are the responsibilities of the campus then? What, what do you do? Um, kind of in a nutshell, what you do is you, you oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the campus, um, which can really be anything mm -hmm. from um, a complaint that the toilets are backed up <laughs> um, to making major decisions on where to place a building or um, know what to do about a student who's got a complaint or uh, how to handle staff members who are doing what they need to uh, do it all goes to you and it uh -huh. all goes to me and and oftentimes your day begins um, when you open the door get out of your car because mm -hmm. I frequently have people Wait. standing in the parking lot waiting to talk to me <laughs> um, and I'll get to my office and um, my assistants in my office will say, where have you been? And I say, well, I've been here for a half an hour. I've been uh, standing down in the parking lot <laughs> talking to folks. So, um, and then there's also the district responsibilities. I uh, attend the, the uh, president has a weekly meeting. It's his president's leadership team. Mm -hmm. so I'm a member of that committee, uh, which is, it's, it's the advisory body to the president that uh, makes decisions about Yavapai College. Mm -hmm. um, and as an example, um, the college recently purchased a new building, or excuse me, another building hmm. um, that is called the CTEC building, uh, hmm. Center for Technology and Education. Here on this campus? Or? It's on Prescott. Oh. Um, it's not on campus, it's actually on uh, near the Prescott Airport. Oh. But to put it in perspective, the building is 108,000 square feet. Hmm. The wow. building is one building, and it, that's about the total square footage of all the buildings we have here on the Verde campus. Is it one story, or it's is it a story. huge? Wow, one that's a big, big building. building. <laughs> Matter of fact, you should get over and see it sometimes. It's pretty, pretty amazing place. Yeah. But it was in the, the the PLT meetings where we decided um, on can we purchase this building? If we do, what's it going to be? Um, where are we going to go with it? So those kinds of decisions are made in these meetings. So they're mm -hmm. big, um, very important meetings, and it's um, they're they're all totally open. Um, there are no um, kind of hidden agendas. The president says, you know, we have this opportunity. What what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. uh, and you're you're encouraged to speak freely. Mm -hmm. Say what what you think so or yeah. don't think. Mm -hmm. um, um, sometimes you know you're not very popular in the meeting mm -hmm. because you have different opinions, but. Uh, that's what it is and what it's about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and changing a little the subject, I was wondering, you know, how technology has changed so much. Now here we are in this yeah. little room with a camera. Little room with a camera. Yeah. How wha, how much technology was there when you first started? That must have been a huge change to now, you know, having online classes and wow. having a, a interactive television classes and computers in every classroom for every desk. <laughs> um, well, there was technology there, but the technology was um, well was very different. It was it was real high tech for the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, especially in the art department, um, you know, we had slide projectors. When's the last? Have you ever used a slide projector? Mm. <laughs> See, no. <laughs> uh, we also had what we called opaque projectors, and the opaque projectors were really um, 
really a, a fancy tool, especially for art departments, but because what you could do with an opaque projector is um, anything you put under this projector would show up on the on the screen. Oh, okay. So we do still have some. So of that. You, if you put your hand under that projector, uh, it mm -hmm. would come up as a as a you know a skin tone colored oh, thing up really? on the wall. Oh, really? Oh. Um, so you could actually take books and things and put them under there. I could mm -hmm. take this pen and if I put it in there, it would show up on the wall as a pen. As a pen, because what we have now, if you put your hand on it, it looks like a shadow. Yes. It looks black. Yeah. The, yeah. So opaque projectors are probably the highest technology we had here. That's um, pretty good. <laughs> and things moved on from there. Um, I do remember uh, we had a campus dean here. Um, her name was Marianne Bamrick, who also, I mentioned that uh, the turmoil with some of the presidents and like that. Uh, Marianne Bamrick was kind of kind of unique. She went from, she started as a, a part-time faculty, is what we called them at the time. We now call them adjunct faculty. Mm. Um, she rose up to become a full-time faculty member, then went into administration, um, became the campus dean here, mm. and because they needed an interim president at the time, Marianne Bamrick became yeah, my college president for a year. Mm actually came out of retirement to be the president here. Hmm. So Marianne Bamrick was the campus dean here. And this was back in, um, this would have been the early 90s, late, late 80s and early 90s. And I went to her and said, I'd like to have a computer. <laughs> and she said, what, what would you in the art department ever need a computer for? And at the time I had, uh, I had taken a sabbatical um, and come back and, met, and at that time I started teaching photography as well. Mm. Um, and I said, you know, the new technology is going to be where, this, you got to put it in the time frame here, this is, this is now um, late 80s, early 90s. Right. I said, um, you'll be able to have a camera where you can take a picture and all this stuff will go into the computer and you'll never need film again. <laughs> and she kind of said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, Marianne, what I could do is I could take your picture and if I had your picture up on a screen, and I wanted to see what you look like, uh, she had kind of strawberry blonde hair. Mm -hmm. I said, if I wanted to see what you look like with black hair, mm -hmm. I could change that on screen and change your whole hairstyle on screen. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, get it. <laughs> all I was right. all prepared to uh, argue for this, this camera and these new technologies. Uh, but that was the little thing that clinched it for her. So I was one of the first people to actually have a computer in my office oh, on wow. campus. Um, and it was, um, you know, had about the size, the same memory that you can get in like a, a digital watch now too. I mean, it's an antique now. <laughs> and we also had the, the digital cameras at the time um, that, w that cost an amazing amount of oh, money right, that you can't right. even use they now. They were really expensive. Uh, and uh, so before the late 80s, there were no computers were no on computers. campus then? Um, you could come up to the library, you could do, they had like microfilm readers and things like that. And then gradually in the business classes we started getting a lot of computers. Um, we did have a computer department, but you know, the computers were big and mm -hmm. everything was big and clunky. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we started offering um, classes in computers and, um, you know, one of the, the most popular and real cutting edge classes that we offered in computers uh, was surfing the internet. Wow. <laughs> we had classes to teach people how to use the internet. It seems amazing that in a window of time of what, less than 20 years, 15 or 18 yeah. years, it has gone from that to what it is now, that every single person uses a computer and does so much on a computer. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, when you think of how technology has changed as well, um, if I go to some of my meetings and I say to people, what was your email? Mm -hmm. address five years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, I, I didn't have an email address five years, five years ago. ago. So think about that. Yeah. And now I have, I have five different email addresses. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's become so natural. Yeah. Such a... Yeah. And the way, just the way we communicate, especially with our offices. Mm -hmm. um, when you came over uh, to my office this morning, mm -hmm. uh, I was doing email. Of I was course. corresponding via email. <laughs> I, mean, I do more with email now than I uh, do with telephone. Mm -hmm. And same in teaching classes, for example, English classes. Now students don't take a 
piece of paper and a pencil and write, they, they get their computer out and start typing and they have spell checkers and all that. Why do you think of that? Do you think it's well, positive or negative? Or I think it's positive. I think it allows people to be oftentimes more creative. Um, if you were a person, say, that, uh, let's say you had trouble spelling, mm -hmm. um, and for you to sit down and write, um, you're very self-conscious about all your spelling. Um, if you write on a computer, you can, you can write, you can get all your thoughts down, uh, and, and come back later and correct your spelling. It, it isn't a substitute for knowing how to spell, but it, it, it frees you up from that little, little crutch of um, worrying about how you write or how your writing looks. Um, mm -hmm. But don't you think that it puts the people in the past in, at a disadvantage because they didn't have that and they had to manage without? And no. if the standards don't change, then the students today have a lot more uh, access to that kind of thing and they can, they can actually not learn to spell and get away with it. That, that's true, <laughs> and that, that would be the downside of it. But uh, let me go back to give you uh, kind of an art perspective on things. Um, the, uh, for me, it was, it was interesting because you know, I work with clay, and clay has been around for you know, th literally thousands of mm -hmm. years. Well, it's, you know, 90% of the Earth's surface is, is clay. Um, but what if I were a painter? Okay? And I look at a modern day painter who needs some paint who goes to the store and buys uh, Thilo Blue or, or Mars Black mm -hmm. um, because that's the color they need. If I were a Rembrandt, or someone even before that time, um, I wouldn't consider you an artist if you didn't make your own paint. Mm -hmm. you, you paint and you buy paint from somebody else? <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> That's technology as well. That's true. So It all changes. It, it all evolves, changes. Huh? It all changes. And yes, it's, um, some people are going to be behind technology. Some, I, I don't I know people still who don't own computers, mm -hmm. um, who wouldn't have a cell phone, mm -hmm. um, and they're integral parts of my life right now. Doesn't mean you can't get along without them. Mm -hmm. So, technology is kind of an interesting, um, I almost said tool, but it's more than tools. It's, it's, it's a way of life for a lot of people. It is, it is. It's becoming a way of life. The whole, uh, what do you call it? Internet age, yeah. <laughs> information age, right? I used to use in my photo classes when I was teaching photo classes, and I was trying to drive home the point of digital photography and how it was going to change photography. Mm -hmm. And people just couldn't couldn't quite grasp the concept. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when you um, think back on, again in technology, um, when in in movies. When they added sound to movies, mm -hmm. everybody predicted that, um, well, with movies, it's going to be the end of people listening to radio. Because mm -hmm. who, who's going to want to listen to radio if you can go to a movie and see them um, speak and act at the same time? Mm -hmm. And then I would ask the class, when you came to school here this morning, what did you do? On, what, did you listen to your radio? Mm -hmm. So people were predicting that uh, radio would die because of movies. Mm -hmm. um, but, but now they coexist. Right. So a lot of things in technologies will, will coexist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the one you want to jump into technology too. That's the <laughs> uh, let me see. Check if there's something I'm forgetting about technology to ask you. No. Well, the other thing I told you I wanted to ask you about on that email was about how the college has changed the way it Treat it, treats students from them being considered, you know, you're really lucky because you're getting to have an education and you should be grateful and you should take responsibility for it. That's how, that's the way I see it or the way I read about what it is. And now it's openly about the students being customers, the being consumers who need to be satisfied. And so the college does all it, ha it can to make that so, to keep them here, to keep them coming and to keep them satisfied. Why do you think about that? Um, I thought that was interesting and, and uh, I reread that a couple of times on, on, on your email that mm -hmm. you sent me about it. Um, and I guess to, extent, to an extent uh, 
we, we have kind of become uh, more consumer oriented. I know a lot of a lot of people in education, and, and I would put myself in that category, uh, don't like to use that term as students as customer. Mm -hmm. um, but if you but if you do look at it as a strict, strictly a business, and education is a business, mm -hmm. um, students are your customers, and you you do strive to make sure that your customer is, is satisfied with their product. You, you have to pay to take these classes. Right. Um, the quality of the classes shouldn't decline. Maybe the delivery should change on you know, how, how people are getting the information or uh, if they're satisfied with their classes and like that. Mm -hmm. That I agree. But how about the student who just wants to get it over with so they can get a job and get yeah. and earn money and their concept of satisfaction is the class being easy and this instructor dismissing class and then just giving good grades to everyone yeah. and that kind of thing and then what comes next are the evaluation forms that students have to fill out at the end of the semester about the instructor what how you know if they like the class and one of the questions is were you satisfied with the class? Did you achieve what you expected in this class? So, and that has weight on the on whether the instructor gets to keep his job or not, or to some extent it does. To some extent it does. Um, you want to, the, the idea of the evaluation is to, is to make sure that we're delivering what we're supposed to be delivering. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've heard of the outcomes for the classes. It's, um, all of our curriculum is based on the outcomes, yeah. what, what the student can expect to learn in the class. Mm -hmm. So you need some kind of a measuring tool for that. Mm -hmm. and, and the evaluations are a measuring tool. If we mm -hmm. see that uh, students are dissatisfied with the class, uh, it's another part of my job. I, you know, those student complaints would come to me. Mm -hmm. um, I will always ask to see from an instructor, let me see your syllabus. What, mm -hmm. what, what were you giving to the class mm -hmm. um, on that first day? As, as a guideline for the class that the, the students could expect to see mm -hmm. uh, as a result from taking your class. Mm -hmm. And are you meeting those objectives? Right. Um, there's a term that people use, use around education, it's called dumbing down. Mm -hmm. are, are we dumbing down for mm -hmm. those things? And I don't know that we're necessarily dumbing down, I, I, I think we're, we're teaching to a different level of student. Um, students are more demanding now. <laughs> oh yeah, um, sure they are. <laughs> and when I first started college, uh, it had to be really something for me to go to an instructor's office and say, I need to talk to you about something, or I think you're wrong about something, mm -hmm. or challenge them on some things, because you know they were they were the teachers, they were almost the gods. Right, that also I've noticed. Now you, you refer to your teacher by their first name, hey John, how you doing, yeah. you know, yeah. whereas not too long ago, it was really formal Mr. Frerichs or Mr. Right. whatever right. his name was. Right. Well, so think back again in, in higher education, um, instructor used to wear the gowns. Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes they would even wear their mortar boards. Mm -hmm. you know. um, so those things have changed. I think they've changed just based on where we are now as a, as a whole society. Mm -hmm. so. Have they changed significantly? over the past 27, 20 years or so, 30 almost, that you've worked here? Yeah, oh, yeah. 30 years, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah but my college used to have a dress code. <laughs> really? Oh, you wow. Imagine that, that now. <laughs> um, you know, we're coming up on for the college on its 40th anniversary, and Molly Googler, who's the, the yeah, my college archivist, mm -hmm. um, brought to one of our meetings some old college literature, mm -hmm. and she had a college handbook, and she said, I want you to look at this page where mm -hmm. uh, it had a dress code. Mm -hmm. uh, could you imagine coming here to college and, and have somebody look at you and say, you can't <laughs> wear that class? <laughs> that uh, would be, I don't think a lot of people would be satisfied with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so that, that again is just a response to um, the, the difference in, in attitudes and, mm -hmm. you know, Again, society or just culture has changed. Right. People are more acceptable of uh, other people, and, um, and, and and even you know the whole uh, ethnicity of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are there are certain people uh, in certain classes. You know, I, I grew up I grew up in in Kentucky, and I remember growing up in Kentucky. Um, there was a public swimming pool we could go to, and we we could swim in it during the day. 
and in the evenings when they were going to, they, they actually changed the water in the pool every day. Wow. Uh, when they were changing the water, the black kids could swim it. <laughs> God. Can you imagine that today? That, yeah. That. And I would stand, my friends would stand at the fence during the day and watch me swim because we couldn't swim together. We couldn't swim together. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. So we've come a long way in a lot of different respects. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that I, I, my point there is just you know change and um, your your question about the student now being considered more of a consumer. Mm -hmm. um, you are a customer, mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I know a lot of people in education don't like to use that, but uh, um, people in education have changed as well. Mm -hmm. You got to teach your change your teaching style. Yeah, the whole society changes, as you yeah. say. It's not just education or this particular college. Yeah. You know, you mentioned those uh, the evaluations that you mm -hmm. do at your classes. Mm -hmm. um, I used to hand those out in all my classes as well, and, and I used to look forward to them. What what I what I really looked forward to reading on them about them were, um, you know, a lot of them is just fill in the little bubble or bubble. whatever it is. Um, I would always, I would, I would kind of ignore that. I would go right to the comments. Mm -hmm. I would hope that people would write comments about the way I taught. Did you get to actually read those? I didn't know instructors got to. Oh yeah, we those. get them. Um, we, what they do is they get them back. Is um, they never see any, they never see your handwriting, anything mm -hmm. like that. But they get, they get back verbatim what a person writes. Oh. So someone actually transcribes all that, and, oh. you, and you get a report back. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you don't like reading the comments, <laughs> um, but. Um, to me, that was that was a critique that helped me adjust my teaching style. And you found it helpful. Yeah, mm. I remember as a uh, uh, when I first started teaching here, and this is teaching ceramics classes. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here thinking I'm going to teach these people everything I know, and I had um, during an evaluation, um, we always had a, an administrator come and evaluate your classes. Uh, two of the students broke broke down in tears. <laughs> He's too hard. We can't possibly follow everything he wants us to do. <sighs> and I thought, you know, uh, I know everything about this, and I'm trying to give you everything. Um, and this administrator, in, in his wisdom, said, you know, you're giving them too much too fast. Yeah. That was so kind of a hard hard critique for me. Uh, I thought I was doing so well with mm -hmm. this. Um, so. Those evaluations and things are, you know, instructors take them very seriously. Mm. Uh, I know most of them would say that uh, they like to see what the comments are. That's, I'm glad you told me that because I had the idea that those evaluations were mostly just for, you know, formalities, but that the instructors didn't actually get to see them. Oh, and yeah. I was, most of the time I was like, well, yeah, just give them five, 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 but, yeah. and not any comments because I didn't know that they were actually important to the instructor. But now I'm going to be more oh, absolutely. honest and try to give more feedback. And they, uh, you know, they, and they stay with the instructor. They're in the instructors uh, in their records, in their um, we, we keep files on everybody, mm -hmm. um, but especially new instructors, um, that's very important for them to go on to receive what we call continuing status. Right, and now I see that it's not just for administration to decide whether to keep an instructor or not, it's also for the instructor to adjust his teaching or her teaching style right. to be a better teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Administrators get evaluated as well. So. Oh. Who evaluates administrators? Um, faculty can, staff do. Oh, that's, that's it. I still look for the comments. Yeah. <laughs> and they're still, some of them are pretty nasty. But <laughs> that's part of it too, so. Yeah, the beauty of anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> no, I don't know who yeah. you are. <laughs> but do, on, on if you're doing them in your classes, um, I say instructors like to read the comments mm -hmm. and see what people have to say and, and be honest with them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think I ran out of questions. It's been really, really interesting talking okay. with you. Okay, it's been wonderful talking to you mm -hmm. and uh, and interesting going through the uh, you know, the whole history, especially the when you've history. been here for a while. Yeah. yeah.
It's amazing to hear how it all started so small and it grew to this and it probably will continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Um, I have a, a, a map down in my office of um, the college here when they were uh, going to start expanding, building some of these new buildings here. And it's a big aerial map. Mm -hmm. And there are no houses over here. Mm. And no houses behind this here. Wow, no Del Webb, really? Yeah. It was all. <laughs> matter of fact, we used to get the. Uh, Every once in a while, you come up on campus, and there would be a cow or something on campus. <laughs> and they had to chase those around and try to get them out of here. So, wow. yeah, a lot of stuff. memories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but also, um, like I said, the scrapbooks are here. Mm -hmm. If you want, want to know more about the history, uh, Sherry Kenny has uh, they have a whole big collection. Uh, really kind of interesting stuff. So and they're here at the library. Here at the library, and you, you can look at them and you know reference them and like that. That's good to know that yeah. they have that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you bet. You bet. Thank you. <laughs>